The sixth generation of video game consoles finally realized the potential of online internet play for players that didn't want to be tied to a desk and PC. Dreamcast, PlayStation 2, and Xbox provided fantastic online experiences over a dial-up or broadband connection. Well, broadband only in the case of the Xbox. But one system didn't fully embrace this new online frontier, the Nintendo GameCube. The lack of support for online play was unfortunate given how popular the feature has proven to be over the last 20 years. What makes it all the more confusing is the fact that GameCube is perfectly capable of supporting online play. Nintendo released both a dial-up modem and broadband adapter that would attach to the system in a similar fashion to Sony's own adapter for the PS2. But in the end, only four games would support online play with another having DLC capabilities. An additional three titles would make use of LAN functionality. For a system that had over 600 games released on it across every region, this lack of support is nothing short of appalling and can be attributed to Nintendo's lack of faith in the future that was to come. What makes GameCube's lack of full support for online functionality all the more confusing comes down to the fact that every single home console the company released eventually had some form of online connectivity. The Famicom had a modem released for it back in 1988 known as the Famicom Network System. This modem attached to the system's cartridge port and allowed users to perform tasks like online banking, stock trading, or betting on different horse or boat races through removable cartridge software. The only gaming focus release was the 1990s Super Mario Club which housed game reviews and previews. The Famicom Network System would enjoy a 13 year run before being discontinued in 2001. In 1995, Nintendo released the Satellaview for the Super Famicom. Satellaview add-ons would attach to the expansion port on the bottom of the Super Famicom while a startup cart would reside in the standard cartridge slot. This cart could also house additional memory packs for storing broadcasts for later play. The whole thing was then attached to a crazy receiver and satellite dish. The service functioned off of a broadcast satellite rather than traditional dial-up connectivity and allowed users to tune into broadcasts to download new games, magazines, software, and more. The inclusion of a hub world users could interact in with created avatars bears resemblance to what Sony would later create with PlayStation Home. The Satellaview service ceased operations in June 2000. The Nintendo 64 would court a more traditional online experience compared to its predecessors with the release of the Nintendo 64 disk drive in 1999. Much like the Satellaview, the 64 disk drive would attach to the bottom of an N64 console and expand its capabilities with a new magnetic disk drive. Bundled as part of the RANNET starter kit, the 64 disk drive would come with an included dial-up modem that was inserted into the Nintendo 64 cartridge slot and RANNET browser disk that would be loaded into the 64 disk drive. Users would pay a monthly subscription fee and essentially have full internet capabilities directly from the Nintendo 64 console itself. A number of fun extras included creating avatars, and with Mario Artist, users could exchange artwork. The original conception of RANNET apparently had focused more on online multiplayer as one of its main goals, but the continued delays of the 64 disk drive saw this functionality scrap before it ever saw the light of day. RANNET ceased functionality in February 2001. In a 1999 article released by IGN64, it was revealed by an anonymous source within Nintendo of America that the upcoming Nintendo GameCube, then codenamed the N2000, would have an emphasis on networkability. Online gaming, internet browsing, and email were all but guaranteed. Unfortunately, these expectations were almost immediately reined in at Space World 99. During a GameSpot interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, when asked about the internet being the future for Dolphin, another codename for the GameCube, he replied saying that Nintendo needed to include some form of internet connectivity, but because of the costs, age of the system's users, and the company's responsibility to parents, it wouldn't be a main focus. Miyamoto would further spark speculation about the system's online functionality in early 2000 when an interview about the upcoming system was released in the UK N64 magazine, stating, I'm very interested in online gaming, and I fully understand why people are so enthusiastic about it. Unfortunately, this statement came with the caveats of cost and that Nintendo would find its own way to implement it, and that it wouldn't happen immediately. This interview also sparked rumors about a possible Miyamoto-led MMO being produced by the company. Internet functionality was again confirmed by Nintendo of Japan president Hiroshi Yamauchi in an interview with Bloomberg in 2000. By May 2001, Nintendo had finally revealed more technical details surrounding the GameCube on its website. Part of this information included listings for both the modem and broadband adapters being developed by Connexent. 
The following weeks at E3 2001 had Sega showcase the first online GameCube title, Fantasy Star Online version 2, which would later be released as Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2. Sega didn't talk about specifics in regards to how the game would work online with the GameCube, asking visitors to instead direct their questions towards Nintendo. In an interview conducted by IGN with Satoru Iwata, Iwata revealed that plans had yet to be finalized and that discussing them at E3 could cause confusion. Both adapters were slated to ship by March 2002, but would be pushed back to October 2002. By the time the adapter launched in 2002, interest in its functionality from Nintendo itself seemed to have already run its course. As reported by CNN Money in March 2002, Miyamoto was not a fan of online gaming. Reasons for this included some good ones that many of us can still agree with today, such as subscription costs and infrastructure downtime. Profitability was also called into question, as well as Nintendo not being able to guarantee the quality of the game in an online environment. While Miyamoto agreed that playing together and communicating increased the joy a game can bring, online play wasn't the only way to accomplish it. This sentiment was reiterated in the official Nintendo press release issued on May 13, 2002, outlining Nintendo's online strategy. Statements provided by Iwata highlight the profitability of online play being years away, and that's why it will be a part of Nintendo's strategy, not the mainstay. Despite these comments, it seemed Nintendo was dedicated to making the feature easily available to all developers who wanted to take advantage of it with their low-risk online model. Dev kits were being made available, and Nintendo would not require any royalties on profits made from online titles played on the GameCube system. The GameCube modem and broadband adapters would finally release in North America in October 2002. The broadband and modem adapters were finally released in Japan in September 2002 and North America in October 2002 at the retail price of $35. Yeah, I know. A European release followed in March 2003. The first and only game that could be enjoyed with either the broadband or modem adapters was Sega's MMO Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2. Players could connect to the internet to play the game with others after signing up for a $9 a month hunter's license. It would take 10 months for another GameCube game to release that made use of the broadband adapter in a LAN-only capacity with Kirby Air Ride released in Japan in July 2003. The North American release for the title followed in October 2003. Up to four GameCube systems could be connected together for four-player play. The following week in July 2003 saw the Japan-only release of Konami's Jikyo Powerful Pro Yaku 10, which could connect to the internet and download new content. Another four months would pass until the release of Mario Kart Double Dash in November 2003, which again would make use of the broadband adapter in a LAN-only capacity. Up to eight GameCube systems could be networked together for a 16-player game session. Three weeks later saw the Japanese release of both Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 Plus and Fantasy Star Online Episode 3 at the end of November 2003. North American and European releases for both would follow several months later. These titles shared the same Hunter's License introduced with the first release of PSO on the system. The following day, 1080 Degrees Avalanche enjoyed its European launch. Again, a LAN-only title, and Nintendo's last to make use of the broadband adapter. Four systems could once again be networked together for four-player play. It would be another 18 months until the Japan-only release of Chunsoft's Homeland in April 2005. This was the last game released to support the broadband adapter for both online and LAN play. In its online mode, Homeland supported play for 36 total players at a time. By the end of the GameCube's life, only eight titles released made use of the GameCube broadband adapter for either online or LAN capabilities. Online play for all four supported titles ended in early 2007. The release of the broadband adapter in Fantasy Star Online brought with it a number of unintended uses for the GameCube. Utilizing exploits built from similar ones found in the Dreamcast versions of the game, users were able to begin loading their own homebrew code on the system through a PC. The basic concept of PSO load or PSUL was to trick PSO into loading code by way of a DNS redirect as the game attempted to connect to the online servers. A method of streaming games from PC was even introduced with the CubeSoft Phoenix software. Though limited by PSO's 10 megabit transfer speeds, these exploits were essential to the beginning of the GameCube homebrew scene. Of course, these developments wouldn't go unnoticed by Sega, who released the updated Plus version of PSO to combat the DNS redirects. 
Network tunneling software such as Warp Pipe and X-Link Kai was able to utilize the broadband adapter to play Nintendo's limited selection of LAN-enabled games online with other users across the internet. Unfortunately, these titles suffered from performance issues with increased network latency, making them less than ideal to enjoy in a non-local environment. While Warp Pipe has long since shut down, Excellent Kai is still available and players today can still make use of its tunneling capabilities for GameCube LAN enabled titles. Unfortunately, the lingering performance issues are still a thing that the community has been seeking a solution to. While Nintendo itself began to shy away from the world of online gaming, its low-risk strategy would gain interest from some companies. In May 2001, Namco released a financial statement confirming its intent to develop games for the GameCube. As reported by IGN at the time, these games would mostly consist of PS2 ports set to release sometime after March 2002. The document further made it known that six online titles were in development for PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, but that they wouldn't be released until a suitable infrastructure was in place. Unfortunately, none of these titles ever made it to the GameCube with online modes. Possible online releases could have included MotoGP4, Street Racing Syndicate, and Sniper Elite, which saw release on other platforms. As early as July 2001, statements have been documented from Hironobu Sakaguchi stating that an online Final Fantasy game was in the works and needed to be released on every platform to see a profit. One can infer given the timing that this was in reference to the release of Final Fantasy XI in Japan in early 2002 for the PlayStation 2. The game would also make its way to PC and eventually the Xbox 360, skipping both the GameCube and Xbox entirely. Given the game's use of a mandatory hard drive on PS2 and the lack of such storage on GameCube, the lack of a release seems obvious, but of course, this is all just speculation on my part. In 2003, Ubisoft announced that the upcoming release of Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow would include its new multiplayer mode, Spies vs. Mercs, in its GameCube release. No statement has been given regarding the cancellation of the mode in the 2004 release of the game. The 2004 release of Mario Power Tennis also misled many to believe it would have online support when the official press page listed broadband adapter compatibility. Nintendo had to officially release a statement confirming that the game had no broadband adapter functionality and a clerical error led to the confusion. Without a doubt, the most interesting release that could have been was a proposed GameCube port of Battlefield 1942. According to Jeff Callis, a former Nintendo of America employee, during a Nintendo World Report podcast in 2011, DICE approached Nintendo about bringing the popular shooter to the system exclusively. Supposedly, Nintendo liked the pitch, but the deal never went anywhere due to Nintendo's overall lack of an online strategy. In the end, the GameCube never became the online powerhouse those of us interested in the feature had hoped it would become, and the broadband adapter's legacy is nothing more than a missed opportunity. For those who remain interested in the online functionality of the GameCube, private servers have replaced the official ones in the Fantasy Star series, allowing them to still be enjoyed with real hardware even today. LAN-enabled games likewise can still be enjoyed as they were back in 2003. Unfortunately, getting the broadband adapter to relive the GameCube's online experience is becoming a costly proposition. Often selling for over $100 or more, it's a high price to pay for such limited official functionality. On a brighter note, the popular GameCube homebrew program Swiss introduced a number of networking capabilities that can take full advantage of the broadband adapter's capabilities. FTP or SMB allows players to easily manage their homebrewed systems without the need of taking out any storage devices that are in use. The FSP protocol even allows for the streaming of network stored GameCube games, allowing fans of both real hardware and emulation to keep all of their games in just a single location. Unlike the old Phoenix Loader implementation, this one isn't limited to the 10 megabit speeds of Fantasy Star Online, offering up the full 100 megabit connection instead. Because of the high price of the broadband adapter, it is worth considering a number of alternatives that have become available over the last few years to enjoy its functionality. For all owners of the Nintendo Wii and Wii U, the homebrew GameCube game loader Nintendo has emulated broadband adapter functionality that allows players to easily connect to Fantasy Star Online servers or play over a LAN for supported titles. Do note that using a Wi-Fi connection for the Wii and Wii U systems instead of a hardwired one can result in some performance degradation if multiple systems are in use. The GameCube and Wii emulator Dolphin also has full broadband adapter capabilities built in and is usable on PC, Mac, Linux, Xbox Series X and S, and mobile. 
The emulation route offers further advantages over the Wii and Wii U, with players being able to enjoy their games at higher resolutions and visual fidelity. With some setup, real GameCube controllers can be employed to make it feel authentic to the real deal. But as with Nintendo, Fantasy Star and all LAN enabled games can be enjoyed just as on real hardware. These alternatives allow players on GameCube with broadband adapter, Wii, or Wii U, and any Dolphin setup to play together seamlessly. After 20 plus years, the GameCube broadband adapter has cemented its legacy of being an expensive, non-essential add-on reserved only for collectors and the most dedicated of GameCube fans. Any players wanting to experience the supported titles can do so with ease using more readily available Nintendo Wii systems or emulation. Even still, playing Fantasy Star Online is better done on a PC with the more expansive private servers and content available. With the exception of Episode 3, of course. Though, as we have seen with Swiss, GameCube homebrew developers can make use of the broadband adapter, leaving open the possibility of future online titles still hitting the system. Until that day finally arrives, the broadband adapter just doesn't justify the investment needed for entry. Even though online connectivity was something that Nintendo had been embracing since their first home console, they failed to embrace it when it mattered most on the GameCube. Nintendo first and second party games would have been a delight to see with dedicated online modes, while third party offerings could have been on par with the PlayStation 2 and Xbox. Why more third party developers didn't take advantage of Nintendo's low risk online model hasn't been officially revealed, but the fact that Nintendo themselves didn't want to use the feature likely played a role. Nintendo eventually began to take to online play starting with the Wii, but it wouldn't be until the Nintendo Switch that the company would finally embrace more standard practices Sony and Microsoft had adopted over a decade prior. Perhaps if Nintendo had jumped in with full intentions with the GameCube, things could have turned out differently for later systems. But as fun as it is to speculate, it won't change the history of the disappointment that is the GameCube broadband adapter.